glad to be back with you after a week away, a restorative week at the beach. Uh, I know that you were served beautifully by a wonderful, touching sermon by Reverend Bridget Kokolis. I'm always glad uh, both that when I'm away, you are in good hands. And that when she's finished, when I come back, I still have a job. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we turn now to the Gospel of Mark, where we will be reading from the first chapter, verses 14 through 20. We begin today a series of sermons that will cover 12 weeks that will uh, help to remind us of the vision initiatives that we affirmed uh, this past June as we concluded our vision casting process as we think about thought about the things that were in our church that have always been a part of our DNA that we want to ensure we continue to bring forward for current and future generations you'll have noticed probably that our order of worship looks a little bit different uh, this gives us a visual way for us to remind you of those vision initiatives that we have you'll see that each uh, se segment of our worship has an icon that goes along with us so that we can have a visual representation and reminder of the different ways that we seek to live out our callings to offer transformative relationships and engaging worship and radical hospitality and faithful service in the name of Jesus Christ because that is what we have always found here. I want to keep those in the forefront of your mind, so I'm going to be preaching about them in four, excuse me, three different cycles as we preach through these four different initiatives as we head towards the season of Advent as we get through the fall. This past summer, I was preaching on them in different ways, talking about the different things that we want to use to lay the foundation in order to continue the work that God is calling us to do, the way that we need to be inspired by leadership, the way that we need to be curious and be open to adaptation, the ways that we need to understand God's calling upon our lives and the way that we need to live it out. But in all of the work of the church, we need to be rooted in Scripture. And I would even say that we need to be rooted in the life and ministry and teachings of Jesus. And so as we do this, we're going to be looking through the first few chapters, at least, of the Gospel of Mark. Those of you who have studied the Gospel of Mark know that most scholars believe that it's the first gospel that was written, most likely sometime around 66 to 70 AD in that time as the Jews were about to revolt against the Romans that would ultimately lead in the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. It's the shortest of all the gospels and so it's some people's favorite, but it leaves out some of those themes that others, uh, other gospel writers picked up on. There's no birth story, there's no lineage, no genealogy of Christ that kind of puts him in that long line of famous descendants of the people of Israel. And what most scholars believe is the original ending before an additional ending was added later after verse 8 in chapter 16. Uh, Mark doesn't have any resurrection appearances either. But instead, as the beginning of this gospel opens up. He calls it the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, as if to say that the good news is continuing, as Christ, who was not found in his tomb, has been unleashed upon the world. As you read throughout the Gospel of Mark, it is very apparent that there's this great battle taking place. On one level, it's the battle of the spirits, the good and evil spirits that are at, are at work in this world. It's a battle of traditions as Jesus takes on the established religious elite of his day. And yes, there is this understanding of the kingdoms of this world versus the kingdom of God that Jesus declares is at hand. I was inspired this week as I heard one preacher talk about the book of Mark, and he was reminded of C.S. Lewis's great Christian allegory, The Lion, the Witch of the Wardrobe, where the Pevensey children are finally introduced to that character Aslan, who's the great lion who represents the Trinitarian God. When they're first told of him, of these great beavers, Susan Pevensey asks, well, he's a lion, is he safe? Mr. Re Beaver responds, Safe? Who said anything about safe? He's a lion. Of course he ain't safe. But he's good. And as you're reading through the Gospel of Mark, that might be some sense that you find in the way that Mark portrays Jesus. He is anything but safe and tame. He comes calling us to re-understand and reframe everything we think we know about this world. But he's not tame. 
He's not safe, but he is good. So here now the words as they come to us from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. And as I read these words, would you listen for a good word from the Lord? As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. It's been interesting to note that a lot of people are talking about the tribes in which they live today. If you're on Instagram or any other form of social media, perhaps, you might see some people who put a picture, usually of them and their friend group, sometimes gathered around the table, enjoying fellowship with one another. They might be sweating after a great workout that they just went through or standing in front of some location where they just did a service project, and they'll offer the hashtag, my tribe. We certainly have entered into one of the most tribal times in our year as we have celebrated, some of us at least, victories in football and recognize that often we are fighting against one another in cultures of one school or another. And we think of our tribe as we gather with 96 or 105,000 of our closest friends. And yes, unfortunately, as we continue to go forward towards November, we are in an election season where people want to continue to draw lines in the sand and try to force us to determine whose tribe we actually fit into. The interesting thing to me about this is that at one hand, it's concerning because it speaks to the hyper-tribal nature in which we find ourselves. Because as humans, we naturally gather with those who are like us look like us, think like us, act like us, believe like us, and we find ourselves, particularly in our society, in a day where we are hyper-tribal. We might not be willing to expose ourselves to those who find themselves to be different than us. But on the other hand, on perhaps a more positive tone, this sense of talking about someone's tribe is a recognition to me that part of the human condition is that we cannot go through this life alone. It's just too hard. We come up against too many challenges, too many times when we need support and accountability. We need someone to help us understand and navigate the challenges of this life. We need our tribe. And certainly as we think of the ways that we are called to follow Jesus Christ, I think we would all recognize that if we went it alone, we probably would not get very far. So thanks be to God that we are not called to live this Christian life alone. We have a community of faith, a family of faith, as we call it, in fact. I was reminded again of the way that that plays into the very nature, the very fabric of our being. As I was gathered here in this sanctuary, right at the foot of these steps of this platform, with the oldest two groups in our preschool this past Thursday. Each year, it seems, we start sort of at the very beginning. We start at the beginning of the Bible as we try to teach them through the important stories of our faith, so some foundation of sense of understanding who God and Christ are would be there for them. And it was my turn to talk about the second of the two creation stories as we find them in the Bible, the one that gives a little bit more detail, the story of Adam and Eve and that great story in Genesis chapter 2, where God, who has created all things, finally bends down into the dirt and the mud and forms a human being and breathes life into it. And Eventually, the God who created looks at that human being, looks at Adam and says, it's not good for him to be alone. And so a partner was made. We are built for relationships with God and with each other. And as much as we would try to be independent, the truth is we desperately need one another if we are going to truly be who we are called to be. I mean, just look at this great story from the beginning of the Gospel of Mark as Jesus has emerged onto the scene in Galilee and calls forth his first followers, the one to whom he will teach and pass on his very own ministry. He sees Simon 
and Andrew, two brothers, and he calls them together. He sees James and John, the Zebedee boys, and he calls them together. Or in other words, he doesn't start by calling one person in whom he sees some important qualities. He calls them together. Look in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 10, as Jesus even sends out 70 of his followers out into the town, into the regions, to preach and teach and to cast out demons and to heal. He doesn't send them out alone. He sends them two by two. He sends them as partners, as community out into the world because we need one another. Theologian Caroline Lewis captures this very well when she says, sometimes I think we forget that being saved by Jesus to follow Jesus means that you have others around to save you on a daily basis. To remind you of who you are and who you are called to be to see you and appreciate you and celebrate you, to tell you how far you have come and where God still needs you to go, to come alongside you so that you realize you are not alone. God knows, she says. Jesus knows we cannot do discipleship on our own. We cannot do life on our own. We cannot live into our vocation, our truth on our own. We cannot follow Jesus on our own. We need each other. We need advocates and mentors. We need peers and colleagues. We need friends and neighbors. We need community and camaraderie. We need each other, she says. This past week, I came across a photo of one of my colleagues from seminary who is the pastor of a prominent church in Dalton, Georgia. It was a beautiful image of him standing in front of the communion table that is much like ours, in front of a large sanctuary full of people. There were three young women standing there with him that were roughly fifth, sixth, maybe seventh grade at most. Set on the communion table were elements that we would all recognize, common loaf of bread and a large chalice. But there were also three small silver cups. This was the day that in the tradition of that church, those three young women who had made professions of faith in Jesus Christ and had been baptized were going to be celebrating their first time that they could take communion. They were fully being brought into the life of that church. And as I saw not only my colleague, but as I saw those young women, I couldn't help but think about every single person that was necessary to get them to that very moment. All of the Sunday school teachers and nursery workers those who taught them to sing the songs of the faith, the entire congregation that was not only celebrating with them in that moment, but that was also promising to continue to be the church and the family of faith that they needed from that point forward. In just a moment, we're going to celebrate in time of dedication for Jackson Edward Sang and his parents, Jared and Claire, too. I want you to pay attention to what happens in that moment. I will say that rightly understood, this is a time of parental dedication because the promises are being made by the parents as they bring their child and dedicate him to God who gave him and as they promise to do everything that they can to make sure that he is raised in what we call the nurture and admonition of the Lord, which is a fancy way of saying that he understands God's plan for him in some way. But pay most attention to the second part as I get the chance to take Jackson from his parents and walk him around the church because it's not just those parents who are making promises it is we too as the family of faith who are sitting here and simply by bearing witness to what is taking place we are promising certain things as well we are promising to be the ones who are there to support him, to teach him the stories and the songs of his faith because please God, let him have a voice like his grandfather. And we are going to be there for him, to be his tribe, to be the family of faith that he needs. Because we're being called to teach him what we have been taught to listen for the voice of God and be ready to respond when it calls, to put your faith 
and trust into Jesus Christ, that you have a full understanding of who you're supposed to be, not because of what everyone else says, but because of who God has made you to be. It's a very interesting and subtle distinction, at least to those of us who study the scriptures on a regular basis, between some of the translations of this beginning passage in the Gospel of Mark. It's familiar to us, perhaps because it's got that iconic line that, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. On the one hand, it sounds as though those fishermen are simply going to be leaving their current trade and go put the skills that they have to use in another where they would be catching people for the kingdom of God. But in other translations, it's not simply, I will make you fishers of people. It is, I will make you become fishers of people which is a truly subtle but profound distinction because it's not simply that they're being called to be who they are and go take that and be it somewhere else no they're being called to become something more become something greater as they leave their family and join a new one as they leave one tribe and join another and come to understand their true purpose in following Jesus Christ and proclaiming that the kingdom of God is at hand. I'm moved by that as I think of the way that we seek to offer that same teaching and that same understanding as a body of believers, as a community of faith, where here we recognize that this family is not supposed to reflect the other families and tribes that are out in the world we're supposed to do what Paul tells us to do when we move beyond the evils of this present age and we reflect the new creation that we are called to become in Jesus Christ. When everybody else is consumed by conflict and hate, here in this family we do it different. And we find ways to welcome and to love. Where others draw a line in the stand over distinctions without a difference, we say that in this place all are welcome. While others ignore the needs of those around them, we say that here you will find radical hospitality. And arm in arm, we go out from this place each week to love and to serve the Lord. Because that's our family of faith. And it takes all of us. Because not everyone has a good and full biological family to hold on to and to support them. I think of some in the life of our faith who have no blood relatives or no one with them as they are preparing to even take their final breaths. And yet I have watched as this community of faith has taken those people who claim that they have no family and have said, no, we are your family. When you think you have no tribe, just look around you. What a tribe we have. What a family of faith we are called to become where the relationships that we have with one another continue to transform us and help us find our true purpose in Jesus Christ. May we always remember the tribe and family that we are called to be. For the sake of our church and for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of God's word.